Then. <laughs> if this transformed above you, what would you do? Cry. She uh, seems very calm. The correct answer, shit myself. Hello and welcome to the Best and Worst Pictures Podcast. I'm your host, Jake, and with me as always, my good co-host, Ian. Me, Ian. And joining us as per usual is my other famed human co-host, Mud. How you doing? Famed human. Mud, how does it feel to be famed human? You know, you, homo habilis, homo erectus, cro magnon. Mud. Homo modulus. What is this show, you might ask? Well, every other week we sit down and watch a best picture winner <laughs> and determine one of the best or worst pictures as compared to the other winners. And this week we're discussing the... 19th? 19th best picture winner ever, which is, of course, <laughs> the hit 1946 extravaganza, the best years of our lives. And to start we us off... did that one. We're doing Gentleman's Agreement. Oh, 20th! The hit 20th best picture winner ever, which is, of course, the extravaganza from 1947 Gentleman's Agreement. And to start us off, Mud has collected some fun facts, which Ian and I have not heard ahead of time. So, Mud, take it away. All right, guys. So this is Gentleman's Agreement. It was released on November 11th, 1947, and it was released by 20th Century Fox. It... Rest in peace. <laughs> Rest in peace. It's directed by... Elliot Kazan, who's also known for On the Waterfront, A Streetcar Named Desire, oh, okay. and another film that I wrote down because it's just a very funny title. It's called America, America. Woo! Love America, America. Yeah. I, I know Streetcar. Um, yeah. And I think we're watching On the Waterfront. Oh, okay. Cool. Sure. I'm confident because yeah. it's right before Marty, which is the shortest one, 90 minutes. Yep. Um, as for a fun fact, I wrote down a quote about him. Quote, without question, the best director we have in America and capable of performing miracles with the actors he uses, end quote. That is quote that about is, Frank Capra or th Frank Lloyd? That is about Elia Kazan, <laughs> the director of this film. Okay. And the person who said that was Stanley Kubrick. Oh, okay. Yep. That one. Now, I don't know if he's going to be able to beat Guy from The Lost Weekend. Yeah. Uh, Leo, I believe. Maybe. But <laughs> That might be the one before it. Either way. As for the ratings of this film, we have a 7.3 out of 10 IMDb, 76% Rotten Tomato critics, okay. and 78% Rotten Tomato audience. Hmm. I have a strong feeling this film's going to be 7. As for the um, actors in it, the lead is Gregory Peck. Oh, Moby Dick fame. To Kill a Mockingbird fame. He's Atticus. Yes, he's also... In Moby Dick, yeah. yeah. Um, as for a fun fact <clears throat> about him, this is kind of a weird one, but his grandson, Ethan Peck, was on an episode of That 70s Show as a young Kelso. That's so cool. Yeah. The next actor we have is Anne Revere, who has been mentioned on the show before. She was in National Velmet, which she won the Best Actress Award for. Awesome. She's the one who called Victor Fleming violently pro-Nazi. Remember that from Gone yeah, with the Wind? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I told you she'd come back. Good. Yeah. It's and always good to hear someone who's anti-Nazi yeah. <laughs> being... And the last Returning. actor we have is Albert Decker. He was known for a lot of films. The one I decided to mention was Never Say Die, because that sounds like a James Bond movie. Yeah. We love James Bond here. Also, his death was um interesting. He was found blinded and gagged with his hands tied in a bathtub. There's a strong chance it was autoerotic asphyxiation. Yeah. Let's go. Now, when I say gagged, I mean like with a ball gag. So anyways, um, Poor guy. Daryl, Poor Zanuck, guy. Zan Daryl Zanuck, who was the producer of this film, decided to make the film after he was denied entry into a co country club based on the assumption that he was Jewish. Ooh. He is not. It's based on a novel by Laura Hobson. I won't spoil the plot, but it does have to do with um, Jewish discrimination. Okay. Now, does the movie have to do with it? Because yes. I know in the last ones... Uh, it is not like the life of Emile Zola where they don't even use the word Jew. Um, I actually have read the entire plot of this film. That's good. Yeah, before we even did the show. Like, this wasn't me, like, reading it while I was doing fun fact nope, research. That's fair. I read it, like, a year ago. So, yeah. Um, there was actually concern when they were making the film. I just want to talk about all the censors that they had to go through to get this film made. So, this film's about people discriminating against Jewish people. <laughs> Yes. There was concern from the National League of Decency about having <laughs> the main actress's character be a divorced woman. The National League of Decency? That's what I'm taking away from that. What the fuck is that? Yeah. Are there seven of them? <laughs> <laughs> there were six. Actually, there were five. Oh, my God. Um, Even worse. 
this was an interesting thing, and I'm bringing this up because it's actually going to be relevant to the plot of the film. Samuel Goldwyn, a fellow producer, actually asked um, Zanuck not to make the film as to, quote, not stir up trouble, end quote, for fellow Jewish people. What's more, a lot of people warned Zanuck that the film probably wouldn't pass censors, as a uh, Hays Code enforcer by the name of Joseph Breen was known to be very anti-Semitic. <laughs> <laughs> That's insane. So, yeah. Like, I want to make it clear, like, the Hayes Code, which is supposed to, like, you know, make sure that everything's top of the line. One yeah, of the one board of the guys, members, violent... anti-Semitism. Yeah. That's ridiculous. You can't ridiculous. put Judaism in a film. That's against the law. <laughs> That's Lord. not Christianity. Exactly. Wow. wow. Uh, finally, Peck took the leading role after Grant turned it down. Cary Grant, sorry. Okay, thank Peck you. Took the gr- Peck took the leading role after Cary Grant turned it down. Peck was actually advised not to take the role. What's more... There is an actual Jewish actor in the film who was given a lesser role just so he could appear in the film. Like he was like, I'll take any role. That's cool. That's really... Maybe in a way, because it's like, they were like, we don't really want you in the film. And he's like, I'll play the most minor character. Oh, okay. If yeah. that's the case, that's uh, That's good. how I read it. As for the um, awards that it won, Elia Kazan took home Best Director. It won Best Picture, beating out Crossfire, The Bishop's Wife, Great Expectations, and Miracle <laughs> on 34th Street. Mm-hmm. Um, Anne Revere actually lost the Best Supporting Actress award to Celeste Holm, who I did not mention yet, but she's also in this movie. Okay. So uh, we're seeing a lot of double ups in the su- in acting category. They there's a lot of that even now, I guess, because there was a couple. There was years. one with the Irishman yeah. recently, yep. but like I think it's interesting because it's been happening like every year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as for the awards, it was nominated for Peck was nominated for Best Actor, but he lost to Ronald Coleman for A Double Life. Um, there was a Best Acting Actress Award for the lead female. I forgot to write down her full name, though I only wrote McGuire. Who's Toby not... McGuire. Toby McGuire was nominated for Best Actress, but she lost to Loretta Young for The Farmer's Daughter. Okay. It was nominated for Best Screenplay, but it lost to Miracle on 34th Street. And it was nominated for Best Film Editing, but it lost to Body and Soul. And finally, to round us out, the Mary Pickford fact for the week. Yes! Woo! She made exactly one. Technicolor film in her life. Okay. Which one? 1934's Star Night in the Coconut Grove. Hmm. We love Technicolor. 34. That's That's early as fuck. There's a lot of early Technicolor films that don't get a lot of credit and praise. Mm -hmm. Wow, credit and praise. Not credit and craze. You just did a spoonerism. Yeah. But no, there's a Technicolor has been a thing for quite a bit. It was. It just wasn't popular to Wizard of um, Oz. uh, Cabin of Dr. Caligari has some like over color technicolor yeah. aspects with the blue and then the um like sepia yeah, tan yeah no technicolor had been a thing it was just wizard of oz is what made it blow wizard up. of oz is basically color let's be real like that's it's ins- color that stuff's insane yeah detail on that oh my god all right so with that let's jump into it we just watched gentleman's agreement baby yeah uh, 1947, Gentleman's Agreement. Wow. I yeah, think is I agree, our wow. general reaction. I know. It's really funny because, like, just two movies ago, we were starting to complain about the 40s just being an absolute fucking slog. Oh, my God, dude. And, the, like, some of the worst ones came out recently. But then Agreed. The Lost Weekend came out recently. And it's like, that's one of my favorite movies of all time. I can say it. And now... Gentleman's Agreement, which may not be on the same level, but it's fucking amazing. I agree. It's not on the same level, but it's also amazing. <sighs> yeah, we'll talk about it. Um, I think I want to start because I don't have many notes. Mud doesn't have many notes, and Ian has Ian, like, several Ian, I feel pages. like we'll have the floor. I have a lot to say, but not a lot of notes. I have Ian. pages of notes. All right. I've been saying the past few episodes, I'm surprised that the code allowed for this. Blah, blah, blah. But over the past like five movies obliterating some of the code's things, I've realized the code is like anything else where it's like a case-by-case basis. Yeah. In the sense that the people making the movies have some mildly significant power to barter and negotiate if their movies push the envelopes a little bit in that capacity. It's interesting you say that because like one of the big concerns was that one of the code guys was like, knowingly like openly an anti-semite and yep. probably wasn't gonna approve the film yeah yeah it's really crazy to think about that too and this movie absolutely depending on level of code intensity might not have been a thing and i'm really glad it was a thing because it's yeah. for 1947 to have these themes and messages and not to just be so blatant and like 
strike you over the head with it. It's actually really somewhat subtle with a lot of its elements. It's yeah. it's complex the way it deconstructs the idea of hating another group of people. Mm-hmm. Yes, 100%. Absolutely. I mean, you got things like the girlfriend character. I think her name's Kathy. Or Kathy. Kathy. Kathy, yeah. Kathy, basically, um, is the... It, oh, my goodness. It's, it's hard to really explain because she's not really easily describable and only to the sense that like hmm. i got it you got it yeah kathy is one of the she's very passively activist quote quote she's a passive activist where when she's with gregory peck's character phil um she's like oh my god i hate this just as much as you do and then in behind the scenes and in practice or in yeah in practice she's very passive she doesn't care like she's she, everyone of the property that she owns she's like oh yeah we have a gentleman's agreement not to sell it to jewish people well, she's like oh well they have a gentleman yeah. like she's trying to disassociate from it but she also like when the opportunity actually arises to stand for what she's saying she believes in she'll she pass every time yes. because it's inconvenient for her yes yes and a big important scene in this was the first time that she started to realize that he may be Jewish, and she's like, hey, are you Jewish? Not that it would really matter, of course. It's not a bad thing. Well, like, thing. I just want to know. Like, are you Jewish? Like, yeah, not like, that I'm you judging know? you. I just want to know. Yeah, I'm not judging you at all. And she gets, like, super... I, I wrote down, wow, she's really <laughs> digging her own grave. Holy shit. Yeah. yeah. It's super... because she's realizing, like, oh, man, all that privilege I enjoy back home is going to fucking evaporate if I right. marry you. Right, exactly. And, like, yeah. there's so Cause much... Because she doesn't have a problem with it, but she really likes what she's having because... Yeah, because she's she not... not... associated with it. Yeah. Right, and, like, it's so weird, too, because, like, she's aggressively, aggressively trying to illustrate to him, hey, I am not prejudiced, I am not prejudiced, but it's definitely an I'm not racist, but... But... <laughs> My, d- there's a lot of that in this movie. There's the, so many good scenes One of, of his it. bosses is like, oh, well, I don't believe in prejudice with clear panic in his voice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a big theme. I love, I really didn't expect a really, really old, early black and white movie to do this. So many people in this movie are just like, I, that's not true. Some of my best friends are black. No, he literally said that. He does went, say Well, that. some of my friends. And I went, oh my God. Literally no. the classic. The, the classic. Line. You think they get that? Do you think real life gets that from this? I think it's <laughs> recursive. Like fucking this movie popularized it, but the. It came from real life. Yeah. It's it's amazing to me because, like, I also felt like the level that it's, like, hitting these themes is something that we see a lot of today where it's like, hey, just because you don't hate me doesn't mean you're fucking helping. Yes. You know, true. like, we see that a lot, I think, with some characters in media today where it's like, you know, you have these characters who are like, oh, yeah, I have no problem supporting this. And it's like, then support it. And they're like, Ugh. and it's like, OK, cool. Thanks. Thanks for helping. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for fucking playing. I mean, a lot of people are like that in real life where it's like, yeah, oh, but I, don't, I don't get it. Uh, I'm not this. So yeah. It's like, OK, but, but just because you are not racist doesn't mean racism doesn't exist. Yeah. Ooh, wow. Yeah. I. But I feel like that's a theme that's being explored a lot today yeah. with like. You know, like, characters who are like, I don't hate gay people. And then they're like, yeah, well, then do this thing. And they're like, uh... And it's like, okay, thanks for playing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't expect... You know, for black and white movies from the 40s, you you expect it to be more black and white. Where it's yeah. like, say, Johnny, you can't say that about the Jews. And the other guy's like, well, fuck you. I believe Hitler was, r- Hitler was right. And then they punch him. Yep. You know? <laughs> and there's a scene like that in, in here. Best years of our lives. You're... In this movie, there's a scene like that where David and them go out to dinner, and this dude randomly just calls him a racial slur. David just gets up and is about to beat the fuck out of him, which is a great scene. He was trash. He was trash. But it's a great scene because David just, zero hesitation, by the collar, fist in the air, and everyone's like, no. Yep. And dude, like, I want to point out, like I mentioned, like, last movie, The Best Years of Our Lives, was a movie that for just a scene or two, really just the one main scene, dealt with a Nazi sympathizer talking to the oh god who's the guy who lost his hand so I forget harold. harold harold he's talking to harold a man who came back from that yeah and that deals with that in a more overt way to yeah. get and his friend beats across. the shit out of him they take the american flag pin and he puts it on himself yeah. and it's like all right yeah that's more patriotic as opposed to this movie where they they jab at the patriotism in this movie yeah where yeah. they're talking about the beginning of the movie and he's like oh so what's anti-semitism and um phil starts explaining it to tommy his son 
And he's like, oh, you know, it's this, this. They don't like people because of that. And he goes, well, everyone likes us because we're Americans, right? Great that? line. <laughs> Hilarious. But it's funny, too, because a kid would think that if yes. they're that young. Yeah. And raised in that time period. But, like, it's a good joke, they, though. This film also kind of taps on the fact that, like, hate is systemic and it, it's passed down. Because, yes. like, what really makes Phil call it off is the hate spreads from him to his kid. Yes. Who's not jewish either yep you know and that's when he's like this is too much and, and his friend dave's like yep that's the that's the real that killer after that as he talks about how anti-semitism anti-semitism is anti-american it is because of the core values that the founding fathers had and it's completely correct and i thought that was super duper well done and not like a super dummy patriotic like oh not american and just like a general consensus way like yeah like yeah what was written all people <laughs> All people, full all stop. People. Full, full stop. stop. That doesn't mean some people. That's not the people that you want. It's you all know. people. And it's just, it it, it it blows your mind because this is two years removed from World War II. Yeah. This is the year that Israel was founded as a country. Correct. And like, you know, the, these these themes are still pre prevalent in today's society. There's a wow. lot of anti-Semitism today. And it's been on the rise in the last couple of years. Yep. Especially... Not to get too political because we like to avoid politics on the show, but like just this fucking year with the Israel and Palestine stuff, like yeah. it's still not solved. No matter how much people like Kathy want to say that, like them going, ah, how could you say that? Really fucking solves the problem, you know? Yeah. It's it's nice to see these movies where like you know the the real activists are like you are not helping. Right, and I love that scene towards the end where Dave spoke to Kathy and made her realize how silence in the face of bigotry condones bigotry. Yes, I, yes, I love that because she seen when she said after he's like, "What did you do about it when it happened?" She said, "I sat there and I felt so horrible." She said that as if that made it okay yeah. that you felt horrible about watching a bad thing happen. And it's that, like he was like, "Did you leave?" And she's like, "Yes." Well, after dinner, and he's like, mm -hmm. "Like I could hear him like slow clapping." Yeah, like, he was good like, fucking oh, job, Kathy. Proud of you. <laughs> Great job. You finished yeah. your whole meal before right. you got up and well, left and the I racist. I feel so sick that I ate my whole expensive dinner. <laughs> like, well, yeah. Poor you, Kathy. I didn't even <laughs> stay for dessert. The caviar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah like, like dude, dumb bitch. when someone like talks about like, oh man, this bad thing happened and I didn't avoid it. Usually, it's of like regret or like, damn, I should have jumped in. But hers was just like, you know what? I did my due diligence. I felt so bad. I felt bad and I <laughs> ate dinner. <laughs> it's like, I remember, I remember, if I can hop in, I remember a couple years ago in like 2016, there was like a um uh, a women's march for like women's rights yep. and stuff. And I remember I was reading this story from like this black woman who was an activist and she was talking about other rallies that she'd been to where like the cops came and beat the shit out of everyone. And she remembered she was getting ready for this specific rally, and these uh, definitely privileged white women were there and had, like, gear. And she's like, what's all that for? And she's like, oh, it's in case the police attack us. And the girl just scoffed, and she's like, they're not going to attack us, honey. You're here at all. Yeah. And it's like <laughs> – it's just this idea of, like – just the idea that, like, these, like – sideline window watchers think that they have any idea how it's going to work yep. because they're like oh well i saw the last time there was a rally that you know x y and z happened so it's obviously going to happen to me and they're like heh, no honey like it, it's yeah. a different experience when you're actually in it all the time and dealing with different levels of stuff because that activist woman was right the police were never going to attack this specific rally because of like who was attending it yep. so like it's a similar thing with dave talking to her where he's like oh i'm so sorry you had to sit next to a racist that must have been like the worst fucking experience for you yeah, oh, you, had to yeah. Sit next to racist you definitely have felt the same exact way yeah. i have yep. you're not even jewish and you had to sit yeah. to a racist exactly wow. like like it's the same situation yep. where like kathy's like i have all this stuff in case they attack us and dave's like Pah! all right sure you believe that's gonna happen becky go right ahead yeah I remember. Do you guys remember what I said? The themes in the Lost Weekend were the best themes. This is the best themed movie. Yeah. Like this hits the nail on the head. Every single, every single thing. The scene builds upon itself. A hundred percent, and it's still relevant. You can apply it to literally what the movie is talking about: anti-Semitism. You can talk it to black, black, Asian hate, everybody, LGBTQ, every kind of hate, everything. That's... Every kind of hate can be applied to this. Well, that's true too. I wanted to talk about how it's relevant today. It's 
not really discussed. It's not a movie that I'd ever heard of, A. It's B, it's not really a movie that has any kind of, like, great legacy aside from winning the Best Picture, mm-hmm. which is, like, the most important award ever, I guess. Which, it's weird to me that this, like, you know, movies that are talked about all the time, Casablanca, Gone with the Wind, which is really racist, all kinds <laughs> of these classic movies. I've never really heard Gentleman's Agreement discussed ever. This, and it's, um, it's, about five years ago, sorry to butt in, it got uh, the Movie Hall of Fame thing. Like the National Registry movies, oh, uh, it, it got this thing. I think it was twenty fifteen or sixteen. It yep, happened. Yep. Yeah, I feel you on that. But I aside from that, I just feel like you're totally right. The themes are so important and so relevant, and could be applied to any movie today. Like if we you never, want to make a movie like this, we watched a lot of movies during our time at film school. Some movies we had to watch multiple fucking times. True. Yep. Not this one. Not once. Very weird. We had to watch Birth of a Nation. I can see. I can see why though, because like. That's yeah, like, you're right, but still. Yep. This is a good yeah. movie. I I had actually heard of this movie. I had heard of it, and I'd yep. read a summary of the plot, and I knew the entire plot beginning to end. <laughs> and the reason why is because of my ex girlfriend who is Jewish, uh-huh. and you know she's very Jewish. Like she's very religious. Her family hails, or her family traces their blood back very far. Like, it's, 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 I hate to say it's our identity to make it sound racist, but, like, it's a big part of who she is, is the fact that she's Jewish. So, like, I I I absorbed a lot of Jewish American media through her. And, like, you're right. If it wasn't for my ex-girlfriend, I would not have known this movie existed before this podcast. I vaguely knew, I vaguely knew about it because I've seen a couple scenes because... I'd seen one scene, but at this point we've established I must have watched like a video where it's like one shot from every best picture ever. Yeah. Um, I forget what what year in relation to the World Wars did the Life of Emil Zola came out? Emil Zola came out in 1938. World War II began in 1939 in earnest. Okay. But like that's 38. That's run up to the war. Everyone knew that everyone knew there was going to be a war. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's obviously a big part of it, if not the reason that that movie is so much more neutered than this one. But I really want to talk about, like, do you think this movie can, quote, quote, get away with these huge controversial themes that are themes everyone should agree with in this time period? That's after the war. Granted, shortly after the war. But do you think Emil Zola was affected much differently because of the politics surrounding that environment? It was. Yeah, oh, 100%. This is post-war, right after everyone knew what was happening in Germany. That was pre-war when it was the pr- it was trickling an inkling about what was going on, but it wasn't fully happening. And more importantly, they were trying to... They were trying uh, to avoid the conflict. Yep. Yeah. This movie's post-conflict. What are they going to do? Decimated, shitty financial Germany is going to do something about it now? Mm-hmm. That's a great point. I, I guess now that, like, the war is, quote, quote, over, like, it basically is over, but the war, since the end, now they can make retrospective movies that kind of look back on it, and this isn't a movie about World War II, I'm not saying No, it. it's just about being Jewish. It's about being Jewish, and that obviously is a main crux of World War II. So, the fact that this mentality of, I'm gonna call it systemic racism. Yes. It's yep. completely, like, deconstructed in this movie, which I never thought I'd say, again, about a movie from 1947. Like, yeah. this is so... This could come out today. Yeah. Easily. Yes. It'd be the same fucking movie. I'd still give it a fucking nine. Yeah. Sorry yeah. to spoil my score, but, like... All right, damn. I guess the podcast is over. Thanks for and fucking playing. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to talk <laughs> about my score yet. Yeah, so I'm not going to either. Good. But, um... No, no I, completely I completely agree. agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, bud. Three white men agree racism is bad, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> that's, wow. That's our whole show. No, no, no. Three white guys talk about how racism is bad. Wow, did you just describe every podcast? <laughs> that's fair, but like uh, to go more like to go more into it, I think that every aspect of the plot in this movie fucking builds up. I don't think I cut a single scene from this movie. Never. Definitely it's, not. It's phenomenal. Like everything builds up on each other. Everything goes in with each other. Everything's hand in hand. Every character matters in some specific way like it's it's truly truly impressive that the script is the way it is from phil to kathy to his mother to his son to dave and Anne, to his boss and, and his secretary his, his secretary even and then his other boss who's just like no i don't believe in prejudice clearly panicking 
Like every, every character single character in this movie means something to the theme, to the plot, and that's fucking impressive. Um, I also liked some of the meta scenes. So, like I went over with the fun facts when Zanuck like pitched the movie, Jewish producer Samuel Goldwyn was like, "Hey, um, let's not." I'd appreciate it if you didn't, because like you're gonna make more trouble. There's a scene like that in this movie yep. where they're pitching the idea for the article, and an actual Jewish writer for the 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 magazine is like, "I'd prefer if you didn't, mm -hmm. because I don't want any more trouble." Yeah. And it's like, shit. Like, uh, like I can imagine Zanuck having that meeting with Goldwyn, and he's like, "Yeah, sure, dude. I'll totally I'm consider write it." That in the fucking write movie. Down. Write this down. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> Mud, can I talk about another scene that's very similar? To I that? just want to touch yeah, on one more thing, which is the title. Yes. So it, 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 in some of these films, we've talked about how great it is when they, they title drop. Yep. Or the meaning of the title. Like Lost Weekend has like four different meanings in relation Bang to the here. film. You can't take it with you is used so beautifully in that film. Yep. Agree. Gentleman's Agreement, I personally feel it's the most powerful use because it's not like – uh fucking phil and his boss making a gentleman's agreement about the job it's a line that kathy says in relation to how her community her hometown area keeps jewish people out she calls it a gentleman's agreement which makes it sound honorable and respectful and like yeah. chivalrous and it's like no you're agreeing to not sell you're redlining you're, yep. you're you're telling people no you can't live here yep and travesty it was just like, all three of us went like, oh, shit. Like, I wrote something down immediately. Remember, the, write that down, write that down. Yeah. I wrote down. Yeah. Like, the fucking just pin drop of yeah. that was probably the best hit of a title being said in a movie thus far. Because it's kind of a meme whenever a movie says its own title. Yep. You know, like, it's funny to make fun of it, but some of it's really powerful. Again, you can't take it with you when... when uh. I can't remember his character's name, Kringleine, because he was Kringleine in the Grand he talks Hotel. About the money. Yeah, and he yeah. says you can't take it with you. It's like, oh shit! And everything in the movie clicks for you. The themes, the characters, the story, everything comes together. And that that perfect little bow and the knot is the title. Yep. Gentleman's Agreement. That nails Kathy's character to the fucking wall, yep. and you completely understand who she is because it's like if you really, really, really cared about like you know the plight of the less privileged you wouldn't call redlining a gentleman's agreement yeah. you know yep yep uh, i bet she watches gone with the wind unironically yep can i just say too i agree with a lot of your points uh gentleman's agreement being used in that situation as like a one two punch like oh my god didn't even fucking realize the blanks blankets pulled under you but i also want to say that while i do love the title drop my favorite, well, my favorite title for Best Picture is The Lost Weekend because it's fucking 18 different layers of cool. But the best title drop is still You Can't Take It With You, in my opinion. I think the way it was used in that uh, jailhouse scene still packs a bigger punch. But, gotta say, Gentleman's Agreement, used in that context, oh my god, it's so like, because you don't see it coming. No. That's the best part about the title drops is like when you don't realize why or how they tie in until they tie in that's my favorite fucking part so that's the fact cool. that this movie also did that just like you can't take it with you is really powerful to me and i really appreciate how it was used and it's used oh <laughs> we've mentioned during you can't take it with you's uh podcast that oh you know was this some kind of suicide squad <laughs> is an excellent example of how to just ah, write it in throw it in there who gives a fuck you know? <laughs> fucking Lex Luthor being like, now Fantastic it's time Four. for Batman versus Superman, the dawn of justice. The end of Fantastic Four. Wow. We're like, we're great. Fans. What are we going to call ourselves? How about Fantastic? And then we just cut the credits. It's funny because like it only happens really, really shitty in superhero movies. You ever realize that? Yeah. <laughs> it's like the worst one. So, Mud, to go off that scene you were talking about now that I, uh, that I have a breath to do it. The scene with the secretary is very, very similar to the scene that you were talking about. Where she's like, well, you really want more of more of the the bad ones? Like, maybe what if we get a bad one and it draws attention to us? Bruh, that it, self, remember when we were watching um, Boys in the Hood and Boys in the Hood? Yeah, where we had that the black cop narrative. and Boys in the Hood. Yes, it has the self hatred narrative, where because of what is going on systemically, you start to think about yourself as, as well. I'm one of the good ones. Like, quote, yeah, quote, because I'm you're you're ones. exposed to so much media yes. and like just. It just stuff that's telling you, hey, you're bad because of this. Yes. And you can be one of the good ones. I'm going to really, 
really, really, really, really take us off track here to build on what you're talking about. But if you want to, do you need to finish? No, I was just saying like that scene, that scene hits so hard mm. because she, she says one of the slurs and he goes, what? Can I also, Hold on. <laughs> I, I want to bring something up yeah. too. Cause just cause like, it's really relevant to that in the sense that, um, uh, th- the conversation at the dinner table with his child about like, hey, are Jewish people bad? And then he <laughs> says like, oh no, did, some are bad, some are good. Just he like starts else. with some are bad. <laughs> no, but I think well, he's. St- I think it started with some are bad because he, the son asked, are they bad? I I really don't think that. Yeah, I really don't think it was like purposely. No, I know it was just well, like it was funny, but like I, the movie redeemed itself. It wasn't one of those like right. fucking Cimarron mm-hmm. situations. But my point with that is that like, yeah, some are bad, some are good. That mentality, the secretary also to an extent has where it's like, hey, what if they hire someone who just happens to be Jewish but is a bad person that will ruin it for everybody else? In a there? way, that's almost a mini character arc for him where he's like, yeah, some are bad, some are good. And then when he is pretending to be Jewish and she says that, he's like, what do you oh. mean some are bad? Yeah, yeah. literally. Like, well, there's such a. I, like, I it's a night. Nice, like, see, I don't think he meant. I, again, don't think he meant it like that. I think when he said some are bad, he means. Yeah, it, some of them are bad people, but just because they're Jewish isn't why they're bad. Yeah, no, I agree yeah. with that, but I'm saying it can be read as like a, a little yeah. mini character arc right oh, there. Course. It's just a little one-two hit, and it's yeah. super in the background. But yeah, uh, this movie is full of that. And yeah, we will go yeah. more into that after you. But um, up what you were going to talk about? Well, I just spoilers for Attack on Titan. There's a character in the la- latest season called Gabby, and she has such self-hatred to build on what we were talking about yeah. because she's just been exposed to this world where she's been taught that she's literally the descendant of devils down to the point where her character is wearing an armband with a seven pointed star on it. Cause it's the symbol of her people yep. similar to the star of David. The, the series has been talked about in regards to that and accused of being anti-Semitic, but we're not getting into that. But like, there's really good scenes throughout the series where, like, Gabby's like, I'm one of the good Eldians, and you're one of the bad Eldians. And, like, all the people around her are like, why am I bad? And she's like, because your ancestors did this. And they're like, aren't those your ancestors, too? You know? Yeah. So, like, just the self-hatred idea. It. I'm glad that more media explores it because it is really prevalent, and you just you don't even realize it. You know, just characters who are constantly exposed to, like, this idea that, like, they're one of – they're from this, like, bad group inherently, so they have to prove themselves to be good. It's a weird – it's a weird minority, quote, quote, narrative. Yeah. It's it's tough. It's definitely a terrifying – It's it's tough. It's it's also fascinating to me and interesting to see it. I like seeing those narratives because it's – it happens. It we, happens, it's and it's also something like enough. we three will never experience. We're no, straight white dudes. We got a fucking maid, you know? So, like, we've never had to worry about, like, oh, man, are we one of the shitty people from our group, or are we one of the quote-unquote good people? You know, fun fact, I I did, I got made fun of a lot and called Jewish a lot because of large nose. I don't know about you guys when you guys were in school when we were younger. Well, all three um, of us, for context, you can't see us. We all have large noses. Yeah. I never got that. I, I also got that never got frequently. that. Frequently. Oh, frequently. Never got it. And I was like, no. It's... I, I'll put it this way. I didn't know my nose was big comparatively until I got to college, and you fuckers started making fun of me for it. <laughs> Uh, for context, guys, check out our channel's banner. It's still just all three of us. You should just make it our noses. It should just be. Yeah. But we like, all look a little bit like Adam I, Driver with the I big nose. I am never going to experience it to that extent. Yeah. But I, 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 it's not from a minor experience of yeah. it. I can be like, I, I know that it's not pleasant, and I only got a very minor scope of it. It's it's very, very – that that narrative is – something that i think is interesting yeah because it happens it doesn't get talked about it's kind of like the um the model minority thing almost yeah it, it's kind of like that where even though because it's most of the time that's with asian people yeah that it ends up getting oh model minority they're smart they're this or that and that they contribute of, it still puts negative pressure because if you're not hyped up you're hyping yourself up as the gold standard you feel lesser and yeah. it's the exact opposite for the, quote, non-model minority. Yeah. Where it's, oh, a lot of people consider my race to be bad, and I want to up myself based off of that. 
Yeah. It's it's the exact same thing. It's just as harmful. Mm -hmm. It's it's something we don't see as much. We do see a lot of the model minority story, but we don't get to see it in that self hatred trying to be better scope yeah it's always that's... treated as like you know like look at this perfect member of society and he's like i have no qualms with what i'm doing or how i'm acting no i there's def there's definitely a lot going on with this movie i mean we've literally <laughs> we've talked about the movie but we've also just talked about the systemic issues that it keeps bringing up and that, that it keeps tackling in many different ways i mean it does a bang up job every single second of the movie it does the movie's it does fucking so slapping it, it, there's a lot going on in this movie like like you're saying there's like mini subplots that literally have like a one two three arc and get resolved before the movie's even halfway over like 30 minutes in yeah, yeah. there's so much going on like i kept checking the time like expecting like oh wow we must be barely through this thing and then like oh halfway, we're halfway yep. done and it's already gotten all of this stuff across it's like what the hell's going on I love Gregory Peck's cadence on screen. It reminds me of a young Humphrey Bogart. He's like always calm and reserved. But I think like charming as well. I think he's a little bit better than Humphrey, and I want to go into why. That's my biggest point. Oh, is I it? have so many things written down about how Gregory Peck's great. Go in, bro. All right. So Gregory Peck fucking slaps at acting. Um, it's not as much in his vocal work as it is in his facial work and his mannerisms. I think he's phenomenal with that. You guys remember the scene where him and Kathy argue for the first time and he goes back out and he slaps his hat against his hand and you can see it in his face. He's seething. He's angry. He punches the wall and he's like, fuck, that hurt. But he's so angry. Like, every single thing that he does, you can see it in his eyes. You can see it in his face. You can see it in his shoulders and how he walks, how he moves. Mm -hmm. It's phenomenal. It's not so much his voice when he's acting he's very very calm because he's a journalist he's not supposed to show all his cards but his face shows all his cards they and even I say he has a poor poker that. face yes and they bring that narrative up multiple times and mud remember when i was like oh they bring up so many stuff throughout this movie mm -hmm. it's so thematic they his boss mentions it kathy mentions it multiple times day david mm -hmm. david mentions it like his mom even goes yeah kathy's upsetting you i could see it in your face it's like fuck it, he, it's so good. Yeah, he and it kind of juxtaposes the fact that he's lying to everyone. Yeah, and it's phenomenal because he's so good at talking because he's so good at writing. But in the same thing, if you look, everyone who knows him looks at his face and goes, okay, Gregory Peck, listen, buddy. It's awesome. I think he was probably the highlight of the movie for me. That It was him in the face. Easy. For sure. I, I was, at first, I was like, oh, you know, it's... it's um, acting prowess i was listening for it because you know mm -hmm. you can tell by how a person talks if they're doing a better job if not you know a lot of bad acting is t you can tell by the voice yeah immediately and i was like okay he's pretty comparable with some of the other people but as we progressed and as he started lying as he, you started looking at his face and his shoulders and his movements and his slouch and what was happening it was it very very re much reminded me of the guy from the lost weekend and how his face his haunted face and how he slumped down and how he started doing things reflected on what he was doing but to like a very similar if not better degree he was phenomenal i think I absolutely loved it and he had so many powerful lines and speeches that still hit hard it wasn't just what he was doing it was also what he was saying to a lesser extent obviously mm -hmm. and in my opinion of course but he had so many powerful speeches like when he was talking about the racial slurs to the secretary and how this word, this word, this word. I know it, it doesn't matter if they're just words. The way you use them, blah, blah, blah. And he starts going off, and I'm like, oh, this scene's awesome. Or when he starts talking to his mother about what it means and how he's going to start doing it. I didn't spend, the, I didn't just do this. I didn't sit in my room and do research. I got a job in the coal mines and started doing like every single scene where he was building up off of his character and what he was supposed to be doing. His arguments with Kathy were all with verve and passion and intensity he was still calm and collected but you can see, hear him getting angry you can see him getting angry every single scene where the emotions were supposed to hit started hitting and there are so many moments in this movie where he starts talking about these things and it's like jesus when they start reading the um paper mm -hmm. out loud it's like oh my lord like every single thing that happens builds and builds and builds and builds and he's He's phenomenal. I didn't see a falter. I didn't see a waiver. It was great. Can uh, I talk about a scene you brought up? Yes, of course. Uh, 
the scene where he's talking to her about words and just words alone and if they mean anything yes. to people. Um, she was making the case that, oh, it's okay for people to say those words to you, like, you know, Jew, or call you something even more insulting that I'm not going to say on air. <laughs> it's totally cool to say that because you're not actually Jewish. Oh, that scene where she's trying to console the kid? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Her saying that argument reminds me a lot, like a lot of the Why can't I say the N-word? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, first of all, A, that makes it okay for me to say the N-word to a white guy, which is not okay at all. But B, there's another mentality about this, too, where, oh, well... Why can black guys wear white face in a comedy movie, but, you know, you can't do black face ever? One of those races hasn't been oppressed! <laughs> yeah. The answer so, is, you just can't, so don't worry about it. Well, do you want to do black face? Do black face. Well, the real answer is it's a lot more complicated than you're describing it verbally. Yes, like, 100%. For example, I can say, well, my car's wires are connected black to black and red to red, but if I do black to red, why can't I do that? Your whole fucking car is gonna explode. <laughs> I think um I think one of my best the best examples I've seen I think it was Delroy Lindo was on like a, a talk show and they were like you know why can't I say it and Delroy was like say it say it you want to and say the guy it, was man. like I what and he's like say the word you want to say and he's like I don't want to say it and he's like yes you do <laughs> why would you be complaining about it <laughs> that's that's always my argument I I've met some people who complain that they can't like they're just like I'm just saying like you know rap they say it all the time but I can't say it I'm like. Why do you want to say it? And they're always like, well, I don't want to say it. I'm like, then why are you complaining? You're bitching about the option to say it. You obviously want to say it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And also, like, I, that uh, Sam Jackson did the same thing. In another yeah. Yes. He, I'll say it with like, you. I'll say it with you. <laughs> That's funny. If Sam Jackson told me to say anything, I'd be like, Sam, I don't trust this. <laughs> also, like, the interview, you can tell he's like, come on, I can't say it. And then he's like, why? And then he's like, because I just can't. I can't do it. What he was really saying is, I like to keep my job, please. Mm -hmm. I want to keep my job. I also don't want you to beat the shit out of me, Mr. Jones. That's another point. Like, I think, I think Samuel ends, Leroy Jackson. I think he's like, I think it ends with him being like, it's just, I can't say it. And then it, he's like, it's a big deal. And Sam Jackson's just like, no, it's not. Oh, yeah. Well, like the, the factors of importance, most important, loses job. Second most important, Sam Jackson kicks your ass. I mean, that would just be a trap by Sam Jackson. Then he's the one telling him to say it. Yeah. I'd feel betrayed. <laughs> If I was that guy, but as a human being with a conscience, you should read the room and know what he's doing. You yeah. shouldn't buy into it. And be like, okay, I'll <laughs> say it. Gee, <laughs> one, two, three. You know? <laughs> Let's say it together. He says it while Sam punches him in the face. Yeah. <laughs> no, but like I'd say in the interview, Sam Jackson's like not like trying to go to him or anything. He's like, just say it. Yeah. Not like Delroy Lindo's interview. He's like goading him. He's like, yeah. Say the words it's like you want to say. Like blind spotting. Yeah. That is. Fuck! The best scene in Blind Spotting. Yes, it is. Blind Spotting is also like. Listen, if you're listening movie. to this right now and you haven't seen 2018's Blind Spotting with Raphael Castle and David Diggs, written by them as well, go fucking watch it. It's one of the best fucking movies. I have not seen the show yet, but it takes place sh uh, during after... the time that David Diggs' characters in. Spoilers! Spoilers! Uh, actually, watch the movie. It takes well. It takes place after the movie. I thought it takes took place before. Oh, it takes place after. I found out it's actually. I also after. thought it was. Before. Somebody else is that Spoilers. that is a spoiler. But that's really interesting to me. So I'm really excited but to check that out. However, that um, show I've heard described as even better than the movie. Wow. Two, two things I have on that. One, no fucking way. But two, I'm so fucking hyped for the show. All right, now. we got we to gotta refocus. But the, the our big conversation about words right now links back to this idea like, People who want to use those words maliciously will frame their argument as just, oh, it's just a word. And it's like, it's the words power. Be yeah, though, it's man. the power behind the word. Yeah. So, like, yeah, I can say the N word to you two, and you're both white. And, like, in the moment, it would seem fine, but it's not. Yeah. And no, it, it's, not. it's not. Also, no. like, well, yeah, sure, we are white, but we also have a normal conscience. So if you say it, we're not going to go, cool, bro. Yeah. <laughs> if so, dude, I've had people at my former job that said, I don't want them dealing with my food because to one of my colored customers, not co uh, co-workers, like a co-worker of color. And I went, yeah, you can fucking leave. And they went, I already paid. I'm like, yeah, I'll get your money back. Hold on. <laughs> I, nope. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Like, but like just because I am also white does not mean I'm going to agree with you. it. It brings up a scene um in this movie where he's trying to book a hotel and like they've been told that this this hotel doesn't, you know, rent to Jews. And I actually had a very interesting 
discussion with my coworkers just today, the day we recorded this podcast, it wasn't about racism, but it was about the idea of like coded wording. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not outright saying I'm not going to rent this room to you because you're Jewish, mm-hmm. but I'm going to use arguments that are adjacent. He's like, we have respectable customers here yeah, and stuff like that. Slight you know, cause, like it's the same thing with like yeah. your situation, Ian, where it's like, they're not outright saying, I don't want that person to handle my food because they're black. They went, can you be, can you do, it? I don't want anyone else doing it. And I'm like, I'm the only white guy here. I know what you fucking mean. Yeah, exactly. It's coded. It, it, it's using words that are more palatable so that if anyone tries to attack you, you have a shield where you're like, hey, I, I didn't say that. And it's yep. like, no, but you strongly fucking implied it. I just went, yeah, dog, you can leave. Yeah. I'll get you your money back. No, I've I've really seen a lot of that in life. Where, like, Sickens me. It's disgusting. It's like, I know what you're saying. And, like, I'm going to call you out on it. And they're going to accuse me of, like, you're reading too far into my words. And I'm like... Shut the fuck up. Your words are written in 72 point font directly in front of me. You know, it's other things that have come up recently with like just like coded text in like in political talk where like, you know, politician says we got to protect the suburbs. What they mean is we got to protect the white people. Yep. And it's just it's all over this movie. And that's what Gregory Peck's character realizes is like. Racism isn't going up to somebody and calling them a racial slur to their face. Yeah, that happens in this movie. It happens in real life. It happens in real life, too. But, like, my point is, there was only one example of that in this film. There were plenty more examples where, like, he'd be like, is it a problem that I'm Jewish? And they'd be like, no, no, it's just an X, Y, and Z. Other reasons we can't do that. How fucking convenient. Yeah, yeah. It's like his secretary was talking about. I put two applications in. One, they said I used my regular name, and they said they weren't hiring anybody. And then I used this regular white lady Christian name, and I got hired. Mm-hmm. It was the most liberal news media place in the country. Asterisk. Quotes. Yeah. It goes to show, you know, yeah. that even, even the more quote-unquote progressive things still really aren't that progressive it's great because this film really just the the main point of this film is like a lot of coded wording Mm -hmm. in how people talk to each other is where this shit comes from because it's all proxy talk for i'm not going to do this for you because you're black i'm not going to do this for you because you're gay i'm not going to do this for you because you're jewish nope like you know there's always a mask that they can hide behind but, like, you got to break the mask. And even, like, overt racism is still not verbalized in an overt way. Like, for example, when he's at his locker and he sees – the uh, landlord sees that he wrote Greenberg instead of Green, recognizes it as a Jewish last name instead of, you know, a good Christian Aryan blah, blah, blah. He's <laughs> like, hey, you can't do that. You got to get the fuck out of here. He didn't say that. You got to <laughs> you got to go down to the post office and do something. You got to do something somewhere else. And he's like, why not? It's perfectly fine. And he's like, you know our policy or something like that. Yeah, what policy? Yeah, exactly. Like, like he's trying to like prod it out of him, much like Dave yeah. was trying to do to Kathy at the end of the movie. But like, same with him trying to book that hotel room. It's like, right? Say yeah. it. Exact same thing. There was never a point where the landlord said, "You're Jewish. I don't like you. Leave." Yeah. But the subtext of what everything he was saying implied that very strongly to the point yeah. where it felt so jarringly realistic with actual racist people trying to cover their tracks. You know what I mean? <laughs> This film, I I want this film taught in film school. Agree. Like, this This is also a masterclass in writing. Because they nail every scene where he's like, why is it a problem suddenly? And they're like, well, it's it's not because you're Jewish. And he's like, isn't it, though? I didn't mention that. You just brought that up. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Trying to, like, push it on each other where it's like, I'm not not being racist. Literally, this entire movie is, I'm not racist, but... Exactly. And like yeah. you said, there's really only one scene where someone overtly says, I don't like you because you're Jew-. He doesn't say that. And it's him. like, even then, he's like, hammered. Yep. You know? He even begins, it, he doesn't start it off with that. I don't like officers. It's yeah, because uh, Dave's in the army and he's wearing his officer's uniform. He's a pilot. Hell of a pilot, kid. Yep. And I think that goes a long way in showing like, yeah, occasionally you'll get the asshole who can't read a room and will say overtly, I don't like you because you're X, Y, and Z. Yep. But... Most of the time, it's going to be a lot more subtle than that. And uh, you know what the thing is? Even the subtlety gets noticed, and it's not. It's not addressed. Yep. 
Yeah. So in real life, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's, there's, it's super tough. Because it's there's this fake bullshit way we all talk to our, each other where we're yeah. like, oh, that would cause a ripple in the conversation. I'm just going to uh, – Kathy. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to say anything. Cause... She's not going to say anything. And she was like, oh, I, I just can't get over that scene towards the end where what did you do about it? And she replied like, "Oh, I, I felt ate so bad. all my dinner like a good girl. I ate no, all no, no. my dinner like a good girl. I cleaned now. my plate. <laughs> my tummy it, I was now. so upset." She said, "I felt bad about it, as, as if that's an okay thing." I to do um, in even I can say, I'll admit it. I'm I'm guilty of being like her sometimes. A- at work, I will have customers who will say things to me that are pretty fucking terrible. Yep. Because they think that I'm automatically on their side because they're like 80 years old and horrible people yeah. and i'm just like mm-hmm. and then i finish their like thing as quickly as possible i'm like have a day you know yeah. what my favorite thing is i call people out so i'm very blunt you guys know I'm very i know blunt. you're blunt but if i'm blunt i will lose my job if my job relies on me having to agree and pander to racists i don't want it fair i mean i'm not trying to say like every customer i have is like that it's yeah. like the rare diamond in the rough and then like i'll look at my coworkers and i'll be like that was shitty and this is just me, like, airing yeah. my dirty laundry. I'm definitely guilty of being a Kathy occasionally. Yeah. If I'm not at, like, work, I will definitely, like, rain down hell upon somebody. <laughs> but like, a lot pretty frequently. Yeah, but, like, <laughs> Ian, you don't even have a job right now, so shut no, the fuck up. True. I, I'm not going to. But, like, you know, at work, like, there's a couple repeat people who come in, and I'm like, oh, Jesus fucking not Christ. You know, yeah. and occasionally I'll, like, not play into what they're saying, and I'll say something, like, super just, like, quick like i had a customer come in and they were like you know why they call it covid19 this was over a year ago before like the lockdown really hit and i went knowing why it's called covid19 i said why and she goes because it's the 19th outbreak of it and i looked at her and i went that's not true i don't think that's true Mm -hmm. and she goes it is and then she left and i was just like okay i would have just said yes and dismissed her conversation (laughs) Like, yes, I do. Thanks. Yeah, I should have. Have a good bank. I, I said <laughs> why because I wanted to hear what she was going to say. I'm like, oh, this I want to hear dumb shit. Yeah. Always. A little bit. I was like, I want to hear what the fuck she's going to say because I knew she wasn't going to say it's called COVID-19 because it began in 2019. So, so can I just say we, we were you guys were uh, again, I don't know if I'm going to cut this or not, but you guys are talking about like, oh, I'm Ian. I call things out. I'm mud. I try and go with it to keep my job. I typically fall in the camp of I always want to hear what a crazy person has to say. And if, like, like exactly you described, oh, do you know why they call it COVID-19? Every single time I will go, no, why? Because I, I, I want to hear what they interpret that, that as. That was, I was in the similar boat. I was like, they're going to say something stupid. It's always something stupid. And, like, I'm, I'm secure in my knowledge. I know why it's called COVID-19. That, yeah. So no, I just like I just fun. decided to test it. I was but, like, but like saying why? yes and say, yes, so it started in December. Blah, blah, blah. Like if you do that, you're shutting down what they could have spurred into a wild fantasy. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. Like they could have. So Plus, like, you don't yeah. get the satisfaction of proving them wrong later. Yeah. If yeah, you but it's start not about satisfaction, it's about they're fucking wrong. They are fucking wrong. And yeah. I probably should have been like, well, actually, it's called it. I should have continued on instead of saying, I don't think that's true. Yeah. I should I have been, would have been like, like, well, it's yeah. called that because it was it, the outbreak began in China the in 2019. World Health Organization, uh, you know. Yeah. Said why. But, I like asking the question, do you get your information from the World Health Organization or the CDC? Because they both agree on that. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> What's your source on that? What's your source on that? Oh, CDC? damn. Newsmax? Really? The Shit, two, bro. Oh, fuck, man. The two largest organizations generally unrelated separately agree. <laughs> agree on that subject and i'm not calling you like i'm not trying to call you out or anything obviously but i'm just very blunt in most things if yeah someone says something i'm just gonna be like dog you're fucking lying. i i just uh, at my job no I it's understand. more important it's more important to have money and live i yeah. get it trust me i don't want to get fired for being rude to customers especially no, I because I've already I'm not judging. I've already gotten it for being rude to customers, actually, yeah. for like other things. Yeah, I'm not. Even, ju- I'm not trying to judge you because I completely understand. Yeah. Even still, there's always leeway. Like for example, if you're rude because of that, and your boss confronts you later, you can explain to your boss, "Yeah, he was saying racist things," and you can describe <laughs> what they were, and then he'll go, "Oh, damn. Okay. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. you shouldn't get fired then. You know. Yeah. I. I mean, I've been blunt with some customers before this, but I once had a lady who was like. I want the ATM set so that it doesn't ask me if there's is Spanish. Can you do that? And I just looked at her and I went, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, 
No. What do you mean? Like, English like not even like English not is, is not the only language. You like, are not you know how customer. when you pull up to an ATM, it's like English or Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. She was pissy about that, and it's not even like I was like, oh no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I literally just looked at her and I just as as bluntly and as flatly as I could possibly muster, I just said, no. Remember how you just said earlier that like, oh, you know, people, white people don't want the option to say the N word, even though they don't want to do it. I don't want the option to switch to Spanish, even though I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> like that's the mentality there. Like the she's so be, she's, she's so uh, she's so upset by the mere presence of a button she's never gonna fucking press. <laughs> That's what I'm, That's I'm what also. I'll just say this: I don't speak or read Spanish. Sometimes I pull up to an ATM, and because the buttons mean the same thing no matter what, just for shits, just to entertain myself, I will press Spanish and then just like go through it and pretend I'm like a fucking god who can just <laughs> understand. But it's the same three buttons every time. I, re yeah. I really hope that the machine like swapped the delete your $10 million button, <laughs> button with the withdraw money button. <laughs> Funny as shit. All right, all right. Let's, let's, let's call it. Can I talk more about... This movie's very, very funny in yes. some scenes. He... Kathy calls him. Oh, how are you? I'm fine. I wish I was dead. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Why is it hilarious? That? I need that as a fucking macro image to send to people. That, that's really funny. The Oh, everyone loves us because we're American. Hilarious. There's some really, really good commentary at the beginning about like journalistic integrity. The boss goes, oh, you know, I keep unintentionally stealing ideas. And she goes, that's what keeps the journal fresh. Hilarious. <laughs> like shit like that is so funny. And then it also has like it's very realistic light normal humor throughout a day that it's not supposed to be comedy but those real things are what keeps the movie like real and like heartfelt and light for me yeah you know what i mean that's the thing with you christians oh at the end of the that movie the at the end of the movie line. at the end of the movie after phil Fine reveals he's christian and he says something to one of the editors. The editor says, that's what you Christians are always like, huh? And he just rattles off stereotypical, like, Jewish assets, like, loud, obnoxious, and stuff yeah, like that. he fucks with them, and it's so funny. It's it's such a good line, because it's also, like, prodding it like the, hey, stereotypes are kind of bullshit, aren't they? It's so fucking funny. Yeah. And there's the really, really funny lines. There's really good character progression. Man, we didn't talk about how Kathy gives that house that she always wanted to live in to David and Anne. To that's show that so, that's her finally that proving, changed. yeah, she will be in the stink with them. It's awesome. It's just because Dave made her realize through that. You know what I just realized? Yeah. <laughs> she broke the gentleman's agreement. Yeah. Fuck. Oh, wow. Fuck. It's so good. It's so good. Uh. The character progression in this movie, like you said with Phil, he has that character progression. He's, he's, he's a good person, tr tried and true throughout. I actually fully believe that. But you get to see, you see it in his eyes as he goes along. The more and more shit happens, the more sunken he is about it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think things like that are phenomenal. Yeah. That's why I really love this movie so much. So I think and I did want to say, uh, despite it being, it's it's cinematically like okay. You know, it's it's. There's no. There's only a couple inches. There's a shots. couple of really really good shots. The scene in the hotel after they ring the bell. The uh oh, Jewish person, get him out of my hotel bell. <laughs> Which also, what the fuck? Why is there a bell for that? <laughs> I mean, he left on his own volition. Yes, but the the, the bell hop was coming. Yeah, which that wow. shot where he's just standing the there all angry staring, and everyone at out of focus is staring yes, at him. It's Beautiful. so good. Then there's the shot after him and Kathy have the really big argument and they break up because she's like, "I admit it, I'm happy I'm this way because X, Y, and Z." And it's like, "Hey, pretty fucked up to say." That being said, appreciating what you have is cool, but like, fuck, don't do it that way. Yeah, like then. He's laying in bed and everything around him is all dark, but there's still the light on his face showing that he did the right thing, but everything right now sucks. Yes. And it's phenomenal. There's not a lot of like, oh, cinematic, wow, that transition, wow, this shot. Yeah. But there's those, it, it, like they say in Deadpool, four or five moments that yep. really make something perfect. And this Worth movie it. doesn't overuse the camera. It's almost like what fucking Apartment Guy said. Or Apartment Guy. He's... Is a yeah, guy. If, it's you're, like if, you spo guy. if you spend too much time focusing on the composition of the shot, you might lose something. You might lose something. This movie is very, very simple, but the few shots that really, really go, go hard, make it great. Mm -hmm. I think this movie. I, I I'm. A, do you have anything more to say? I'm no, I think we're wrapping up. I really think this movie is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I think it's. Why it won Best Picture? Uh, the performance and the script. Both yep. Bang up. 
but mm-hmm. absolute banger. I understand why people say Peck's one of the best actors of all time. Still want to watch To Kill a Mockingbird. And oh, I can't it, wait. Actually. You've never seen To Kill a Mockingbird? Um, I've seen some of it. I haven't seen all of it. Yo, you're missing out, bro. Yeah. Kill a Mockingbird, great book, great movie. I've read the book. It's I was amazing. actually about to slaps. watch Kill a Mockingbird um, this one night, because I've, ne- I've also never seen it. I'm also in that camp. Um, but it wasn't available on any service, so I watched Spartacus instead. Spartacus slaps. Spartacus, Spartacus slaps. Oh, we'll, we'll get to we'll, the fucking Oscars We've been that over year. it. We're going to get to it. Fucking stay tuned for the but, apartment review. This movie, to me, one, because it's great through and through. This mm-hmm. isn't, I can pinpoint one thing. This is like, oh, three or four things that I can see that really fucking set this above other things. Mm-hmm. Um, We're getting to the point now where movies are winning, not because of one specific thing, but because it's the best picture right. yes Dude, that's oh it's the and then the next board. one we're gonna go why did this win best picture because we always do that yeah, yeah. hamlet oh it won because it's a shakespeare thing people love shakespeare oh done there's no way that's the reason it won best picture so speaking of hamlet coming in two weeks in out of ten. Ten. this movie's great like the, i i cannot find flaw like Oh no, there's one, the, the ends, they play a little bit of music, and then it ends. Oh fucking, who cares? It's a banger for the whole two hours. Like, phenomenal acting, amazing script. I've already sucked the whole movie out. Like, it's it's amazing. Everything matters. Nothing should be cut. That is the sign of a perfect film. Nothing should be cut. Everything matters. Every actor does their thing. Every character matters. Every theme and message and sentence in this movie matters to the movie. T- how can you give it anything less? So, can I say... um. I was leaning towards nine, and as we have talked about it and as we have discussed it, you're absolutely right. I've been thinking more and more, and as we've, like, dived deeper into the themes, it's only made me appreciate this movie more. So, ten. I am sticking by my measly, tiny score of nine. Why do you hate this movie? I clearly hate this movie. Um, But can I just say something else, too? And I'm not making this up. I literally just slotted this on my list. The Lost Weekend is number one. <coughs> Casablanca, number two. This is number three. The three best movies are all from the 40s. Remember, like, two weeks ago when we were like, the 40s have produced just shit. Just <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible shit. I'm in the same boat. My top three are all from the 40s, but they are in a different order. Damn, that's yeah. funny. Uh, yes, is this your favorite? Yes. Ooh. My new favorite. Overtaking The Lost Weekend from two weeks ago. And what's your Or a worst? month ago. Uh... It's cavalcade. It's never not going to be cavalcade. So Rebecca's my least favorite, but I'm having a lot of trouble deciding weekend or this because they're both amazing for different reasons. They are. This is more. This is more of like a wow, holy shit, heartfelt. And the other one was like, what the fuck? Definitely the trip, the whole journey. It's like it's like right trying now. to compare yeah. like a really good steak to like a really good. I'm gonna say fish. Yeah. They're good for different reasons. Yeah. The palette of both of these movies are so different, and mm-hmm. I, I, I'm I having trouble deciding. I have both. Right now, The weekend and The Gentleman. Lo- the weekend, the, <laughs> the Lost Weekend. Blinding Lights does slap, the, dog. The Lost Weekend and The Gentleman's Agreement are both up there. They're both tens. I think it's just Gentleman's one. Agreement. Is it? Yeah, it's Not just Gentleman's okay. Agreement. Um, Sorry, for, just wanted to. That's fine. Gentleman's Agreement and The Lost Weekend are both number one for very different reasons, but yeah. they're both all, like... Almost. It might be because we're over a month from seeing a Lost Weekend at this point, whereas Gentleman's Agreement's fresh in my mind, but mm-hmm. right now I'm putting Agreement over Lost can, Weekend. Can I also say, that's totally cool because you literally just watched the movie, but two weeks from now, when the next episode airs, I'm going to ask you what your favorite and least favorite is, and if that movie isn't the best or really worst one, I want to hear whether you, which one you've decided on. Okay. So, so tune in. on it, think about it, and let yeah. your own brain. But tune right now, in. They are both tens. Yeah, they and are should, both. I We've got two tens, boys. Yes, we have, and I kind of spoiled it. But last weekend in Cavalcade hasn't changed. Still one and worst. So tune in in two weeks where Ian makes his decision and to listen to us discuss the twenty-first best picture winner, Hamlet. Woo! All right. Can I can I just preface Shakespeare's overrated? Oh my hell yeah. God. <laughs> Charlie Watson, I'm 18 <laughs> today. Yeah, I don't know what a birthday is. Yo, I was created. Did you know the Earth is Unicron? Oh yeah, fucking transform so that she's exposed and then just cover the top of her with your arm. Please! Oldest trick in the book. Tase the car. Your daughter's had a traumatic experience today. Maybe doesn't understand everything she's seen. Which is not including me, because you cannot see me. 
Racist people have such small dicks. Fucking. Oh, look at me. I think I'm better than other people. <laughs> Fuck you. What do you mean?